Welcome to the Unit Plus debate on agriculture and TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Our program today is presented within the Citizens Corner concept. The debate is produced and hosted by Unit Plus and Hungary's MTVA, a member of the Unit Plus network. The debate can be followed live in the European Parliament on our Unit Plus Inside website, on our Facebook profile, as well as on Twitter using the hashtag Citizens Corner. I'm Brian McGuire. Joining us today to discuss how Europe's agriculture sector could be affected by the TTIP uh, free trade agreement, Mark Tarabella, a Belgian MEP with the Socialist and Democrats in European Parliament, a member of the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development, Matt Carthy, MEP from Ireland, uh, European United Left, and member of the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development also. Welcome. And Zoltan Zamogi, a head of unit, D3, D3 Agriculture, DG Trade, the European Commission, and Magda Stotskayev, uh, each uh, director of Friends of the Earth Europe. We're also joined by Pablo uh, Baldomia, a student at the University of Vigo in Spain. Welcome to all of you. Let's start with what TTIP is uh, before we get to the agriculture part. Uh, is TTIP a fair agreement in the making? Matt Carthy. It doesn't appear so. In fact, if you were to um, draw up a template as to how not to do a trade deal, TTIP is it. It has been from the very start clouded, clouded in secrecy. It was purposely designed and the negotiations have been purposely designed to keep as much information as possible away from the citizens that are going to be impacted by it. We have now a scenario where citizens right across Europe have expressed their views in relation to TTIP time and time again and the European Commission have ignored them at every turn. I suppose the best example of that is the investment state dispute settlement mechanism as in part of it that has now morphed into an ICS which by all extensive purposes is the exact same thing. The fact of the matter is that the concerns of citizens of organisations such as farming organisations have been ignored from the start. So and Smoggy, the European Commission has faced a lot of criticism for this but we have negotiations in Brussels today. How is TTIP progressing in general? Uh, with TTIP, actually, as we say, we are in the middle game, so uh, somewhere between the uh, you know, beginning and, uh, and the end. Uh, uh, we are progressing uh, under the political guidance that we should be ready uh, for a conclusion of this agreement, at least between the negotiators by the end of the year. Uh, uh, yes, as you said, uh, these days we are negotiating. Tomorrow we are going to talk about agricultural market access, uh, useful discussions on geographical indications, uh, sanitary phytosanitary issues. We are making some progress, but again, we are not in the, at the end game yet. Magda Stoskevich, is this uh, the kind of dynamic you expected for TTIP, or do you expect it to crash and burn soon? Well, uh, I think it's difficult to say what dynamic you expect from this uh, deal. This is unprecedented deal, as we all hear uh, and heard before, because it deals not only with tariffs and trade, but the de it deals with the whole regulatory system that we have here in Europe. And I think as such, uh, I, my organization doesn't believe that the trade and uh, DG trade should be dealing with the whole regulatory system of the EU lawmaking. Uh, therefore, we believe that the remit of the negotiations is way too broad already. Um, is it going to crash? It's difficult to say. We are going to talk about the agriculture today. Uh, our understanding was from what was leaked uh, two, week, uh, two months ago. There was Everything was bracketed. So it would be interesting to see how much uh, progress the two sides made and in which way this progress is going. What worried me very much was the statement from Commissioner Malmström after Brexit, who said, like, we are ready to make concessions because we need to close this deal. And the concessions are usually at the expense of people and the environment. So we are actually quite worried. Okay, Mark Tarbella, are you confident that a deal can be reached at any point? I hope not. I hope that there is no agreement on the TTIP. Why? Because agriculture is the, the main policy where we have to fear an agreement. Why? Because on one hand, uh, for several years now in Europe, we abandon all uh, policy of uh, protecting the income of agriculture, of farmers. Uh, we abandon the mechanisms of regulation of production. The last one it was the milk. Next year, sugar. And it means that it's, it's uh, now a high volatility, higher volatility than before on the price, and it's very insecure for farmers. And, and on the other hand, we don't have mechanism to compensate that. It's not the case in the United States. If in the United States they are more pragmatic than in Europe, uh, because when uh, the, the, the price are going down, there is a mechanism uh, of uh, contracycling aid uh, subsidies. 
And so that it's very difficult. Farmers in Europe has a lot of difficulties now, had a very high level of difficulties. And to accept import on meat sector, for example, or milk would uh, increase the, the volatility. And now the volatility means lower price for the milk, for example, it's, uh, it's clear. And so that, uh, you know, and on the trade, and it's my last point is that on trade, the, the trade balance between uh, United States and Europe is favorable for Euro European Union. And Americans, and I understand that, want and hope to, to rebalance the, the, the trade. But it means that it accept more import means highest difficulty for the agriculture. And agriculture is not considered as a key sector at the European side, because it's the last that we negotiate. It's the, in French we said la variable d'ajustement. It's a, uh, all chapters. Uh, it, now we, we this week is the fourteenth round of negotiations. But it means that okay, that it's not agreement on all. It's agreement on nothing. But agriculture is one of the last. It's not normal. It means that at the European level we have no strategy for, to protect agriculture, and it's very important. And for, it's for that reason I fear. For all those reasons, I fear an agreement on TTIP. Okay, Zoltan, what do you say to people who fear an agreement on TTIP? Uh, my kind of general reaction to these fears about uh, TTIP and in general about agricultural trade uh, uh, that, uh, and, you know, that, that was also referenced that the common agricultural policy has changed. Uh, for us this change actually contributed to a very positive trade, overall trade performance of the European agri-food sector. Since 2007 actually we are a net uh, uh, exporter, we are the biggest agri-food exporter. Uh, in general, external trade is really an opportunity for the European agri-food sector. Uh, there was a reference that uh, with the Americans we have a positive trade balance. Yes, indeed, uh, since 2011 uh, we have not stopped increasing this uh, positive trade balance. Now we have uh, six, seven billion euro surplus uh, on the European uh, export side. Uh, of course, in, in you know, different discussions and uh, uh, rhetorics, uh, there is a kind of uh, wish expressed by okay. the Americans to rebalance it. But of course, uh, when it comes to the negotiation, we will pay attention that uh, uh, no uh, sector will be put at okay. risk. Uh, McCarthy, there's a surplus in some sectors here. So why, where is the lack of opportunity? Can Europe not expand its, its own inroads into American uh, economy, with agricultural economy? Yes, it can. In fact, the Irish government only recently have agreed a bilateral agreement with the United States where they're taking in um, some of our processed beef. So I think if you go down to the heart of it, there is no need for TTIP. We can deal with these issues on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. The fundamental difficulty with TTIP as a... As a a notion of how trade um, deals are done is that it is purposely designed so that it isn't dealing with tariff barriers. It's dealing with primarily what are called non-tariff barriers. Now, to ordinary people, what that means are the standards and regulations that protect them as consumers, as citizens, are up for negotiation. And the difficulty, um, my greatest difficulty, is that these negotiations are taking place behind closed doors. So for most people across Europe, the first they will see of the detail of what is agreed is when it's all agreed. And then they will be told, or their governments will be told, it's take it or leave it. And governments and MEPs and national parliaments will be put under huge pressure to adopt this, because if you don't adopt this, you are delaying the progress of the entire continent. And we've seen in Ireland and other countries you know, the, the enormous pressure that the Commission can put on. So I think if the Commission were seriously about, serious about having a, tr a fair trade deal, and one that could be um, supported by citizens, they would be much more open and transparent in terms of the how, how they've been negotiating. And it's quite clear to me that the people who have the greatest fears aren't just farmers, because they have, quite rightly in my view, a lot to be afraid of, but it's everybody who's depending on farmers. So rural and regional economies, consumers who want to be sure that the food that they buy is of good quality, and regional and um, national parliaments who have an absolute vested interest in ensuring that European agriculture projects is protected okay. because we have the best quality food in the world and we should be ensuring that that's protected okay. above all else. Mark Tarbella, they, when I was in London three weeks ago, we were talking uh, about Brexit, but people kept bringing up TTIP, TTIP, TTIP as well, which was a surprise. They were talking mostly in the context of the NHS, the National Health Service, but also about food and what Matt says seems to ring true. How did a trade agreement get onto the kitchen table? Why are people so uh, concerned? about this? Oh, well, TTIP is one of the, as MEP since 12 years, 
for 12 years now, uh, is the TTIP is the, the most important uh, matter for people. You know, sometimes we have complicated the issue to, to, to work on in this parliament. But for two years now, I'm, I go often to my constituency every day because as Belgian MEP in Brussels, uh, every night uh, you go to speak. You are, But TTIP is the most important thing because it, there are a lot of fear for that. And we have to explain the uh, vantage and, and, and disadvantage. And I think that uh, uh, in the Brexit, for example, you, you, I know that, uh, unfortunately, uh, they were focusing on the migration because the uh, populists of Farage, uh, UKIP and, uh, and, some, and some colleagues. But TTIP, globalization, is uh, creating fears for, for some people because they, they watch what happens, and in particular in agriculture. I think that the, the, uh, the farmers lived better before than now. Agri-food is different than farmers. Agri-food... Farmers need agri-food to, to sell the, the, the most part of the production. But I think that we have less <coughs> respect for producers now than before. And is this why consumers are more concerned? The, the consumers not really, they don't care about the farmer. Why are consumers engaged? With more than before. There is a, an inversion of behavior <coughs> now. And I think that uh, people are more sensitive to the reality of farmers now. But farmers are suffering more than before. And so that... People change their uh, way of uh, to, to to buy food, and I think that you know we have a big also a big issue uh, in our modern countries as United States, Europe. It's the for the, uh, the, the public health. The health is the the obesity uh, to uh, in the childhood, child, uh, young people, and of course I think we have to have a strategy on food, better food, hydration and sport move and I think that uh, we have to, to do that and I think that the American model of consumption of food is okay. not the right model. Magda, when you, you look at getting from the negotiating table to the kitchen table and this uh, consumer dynamic as well and impacting the political process, are you more concerned about the welfare of the farmers or more concerned about consumers? Well, I don't think we should put it in uh, against each other because it's actually not and uh, uh, it would be very wrong to, do, to put it against each other. I think what Brexit showed is that the citizens are not having trust in the, uh, in the political elite and they are not having trust in what the EU is doing for them. And uh, TTIP is one of these deals where they feel like it's negotiated in uh, untransparently. It has risks for them as consumers but also as citizens. And uh, that, that's why people feel, that's why people reject uh, that way of doing, of doing uh, like, politics. Like the Brexit the element is that people didn't trust the facts. You could tell them what they wanted, but they didn't want to hear the facts. Are we at this kind of stage with, uh, with TTIP in particular with, with agriculture? Or people, you can tell them what they like about surpluses and, high, and standards of hygiene and, and processing, but they don't care. Mark, well, so I what, think, what, what I think the, the, the yeah. first and Mark. I ah. think they, they, they are caring and that's why you have such a response to the TTIP because actually we are in terms of agriculture we are talk talking about uh, farmers and their future and I would uh, agree with Mark that the way how citizens, European citizens start to understand the, the work of farmers and how they want to be closer to the food being produced. They want to know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. They want to know the, uh, what cycles it goes through before it ends on their table. I think this is a very uh, important dynamic and very important change. And this is being threatened by the TTIP, which is potentially bringing food that is massively produced okay. and uh, uh, the, the where you cannot really detect where it comes from and what level of protection okay, there, so there was there. Coming from Mark and then Pavel's yeah. got a question. No, about the, the Brexit, uh, I would like to say that uh, I don't speak about Johnson. He is completely an irresponsible uh, politician, uh, pampered boy, and uh, he disappeared now. Uh, it's too easy to, uh, to, to, to campaign and after when you, you have a success, because uh, Brexit, for him, he disappeared. It's irresponsible. But I, I, I would like to say that uh, it's a responsibility also for all uh, conservative prime minister, also David Cameron, because he never admitted that to be integrated in the European Union was very favorable for more than 30 years for the British economy. And Cameron spoke never about European Union. He spoke only about the single market. 
A single market was, is very important, was very important for the increasing the performance of the British economy. But never they admit that. But it's too late to say that two, two months before uh, the re referendum. And I think uh, I regret the result, but we have to respect that. And of course, now we have to negotiate the, the Brexit because, uh, of course, you know. Uh, Does this complicate the agricultural element? It, it will be complicated for, moreover, for the British farmers because they earn uh, 3.9 billion uh, euro per year from the CAP. It, it represents 55% of the income of all British farmers. And I think that there are 175,000 uh, farmers in all UK. And maybe the British government have to compensate that uh, and we have to negotiate what will be our repo, uh, our re relation after okay so uh, we have turkey's voting com for it's complicated okay but pablo has a question pablo okay good morning it's a pleasure for me to be here with you i'm not a, i don't know a lot of this matter about ttip so and i think that's because of it's uh, an agreement that it's everything is treated without transparency i think that in I think that uh, young people, at least in Spain, and farmers in Spain, don't know exactly what it is. So, mm. for me. And one question. Uh, I heard that Europe cares about the environment, about the healthcare of the citizens. But with this agreement, the, they, it's easily for the United States to bring food with antibiotics and hormones and, and so on, and some products to, to Europe. So that means that Europe can, in kind of a way, do the same. So pro produce food and meat. Okay. Let, let me ask Sultan about this. So the, the legendary uh, bleached chickens, I don't know how many chickens were bleached in the name of TTIP this time, but it was a lot. The, the, the chickens seem to be the, the, the mascot of the anti-TTIP movement. <laughs> how did you feel about that? Uh, a chicken, but you know, we can continue also with uh, the hormone beef and uh, ractopamine, uh, pork meat. Uh, these are, and I can also give you the reassurance uh, to, the, to the Spanish colleague that uh, uh, these issues are very deep red lines for the negotiators. And actually here I, uh, I would like to also address the issue of, you know, the transparency and the secrecy. The negotiat negotiations are conducted based on the negotiating guidelines, uh, directives uh, given to the Commission by the 28 member states in unanimity. Uh, we believe, and you know, I'm really sorry, sorry to hear all this uh, criticism, that uh, this is a, a, a historically transparent exercise. If you Google a little bit, you find all the European negotiating documents uh, on actually on DigiTrade uh, homepage. Even those documents which, you know, for the kind of negotiation, common sense uh, should be kept secret like a tariff offer, they have been leaked. So if you Google a little bit deeper, you will also find uh, that. So everything is out there. Uh, yeah, I'm, for, for us it's clear that, you know, uh, that there is room for improvement on communication. But on that I think uh, we should also uh, uh, count and rely on what member states are doing. And maybe just a, a final comment that, you know, also about secrecy. Uh, we have intensified our interaction with civil society. We have before and after TTIP rounds, uh, debriefings uh, also with member states. Uh, so I, I really believe, genuinely believe, and I, I can tell you, uh, with, you know, uh, from the bottom of my heart that we are doing something which is really transparent and uh, okay. not hiding anything. Matt, Matt Carthy, let me just ask about the, the, the stand chickens just for a moment. The, 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 the clarifying issue seems to be the Americans treat their food differently and it will make us sick. Is that right? I actually accept the assurances of the Commission in the short term and I believe in relation to hormone injected beef and chlorine wash chicken and I believe that people who are op opponents of TTIP using that are actually doing us a disservice because I don't think anybody is suggesting for a moment that we're going to see large quantities of hormone injected beef or chlorine wash chicken entering into the EU market. That's not the problem. The problem is that those practices are go ongoing within the United States. So in effect they will be subsidising product that isn't hormone injected or chlorine, um, chlorine washed. Now the difficulty that the Commission have had is that from the start, and we've asked them this several occasions, both DG Agri and DG um, Trade, and they have acknowledged that what they will be concerned about in terms of food entering the European market will be the end product. They will want to make sure that that is of the same standard as European standard. They, what happens beforehand isn't going to be a concern for them. So you will have 
US farmers who are by and large operating on a corporate basis, who don't have the same um, obligations that European farmers have in relation to animal welfare, in relation to environmental protection, in relation to farm management. All those things are actually among the highest costs that European farmers have to bear. We want them to do that because we care about animal welfare, we care about the environment, we care about um, farm, farm management. The fact that US farmers don't have to do that means that they will have automatically a significant price advantage over European farmers. And what you will see is during the small periods of time, and they're becoming narrower every year, whereby European farmers have the prospect of making a profit, whether it be in dairy and beef and pig and uh, uh, in, in po poultry, you will see flooding of the European market by US corporate farming in interests and therefore it will make in many cases um, European farmers unsustainable. What you will then see in turn is corporate farming interests in Europe arguing they will be the people who will be actually presenting to us as MEPs and the Commission. We want to be able to introduce hormone injected beef and chlorine washed chicken because our competitors are able to do that and it's given them a price distortion. So in effect TTIP on the face of it mightn't be responsible for all these things happening but in the, the net impact over a period of time will be that the pressure will be put on and we've known from the way in which the Commission have dealt with this and other um, agendas that when corporate interests exert themselves and start putting pressure on the Commission, the Commission will lean towards them every single time. When it's a choice between corporations and citizens and farmers, the Commission have proved themselves over the past number of years to always fall on the side of the corporate interests. Mike, the, this is going to be a mixed agreement, so it has to go to the national parliaments in the end as well. Is there any mission that 27, probably at that point, uh, 27 member states will actually vote uh, to accept TTIP based on, on what Matt just said? Well, I, uh, I don't have a crystal ball, at least not one that works, um, but I don't think anyone does. So uh, it will be put into, uh, into question once that goes to the parliament. But we first have to see what is being at the end negotiated because, yes, the documents were leaked and, uh, you know, there is some documents put forward by the commission. There was a lot of pressure from civil society to actually get to that level. Um, I wouldn't be so... Um, you know, proud of the fact that the documents are being leaked and that means transparency, but that's a different story. So we need to see what is going to be at the end negotiated because we know that agriculture is uh, left to the end and then things are being put against each other and what, what at the end is going to okay. be in the deal we, we will yeah, have so to see. But just if I can sure, make one, one comment following what Matt was saying, I think it's very important. My organization was never saying that this is about chlorine chicken because it's so much about the way how our food is produced and it's going to be produced. And this is what's at stake. It's not the particularly chlorine chicken uh, as such. So uh, I think we need to be really clear that this may influence the way how we produce food and uh, what in the long term our safety, uh, uh, safety uh, standards are for food and what we accept, what we don't accept. Okay. And I think the pressure that may come with the imported food, the way how uh, what, what we have now, the farm to fork system in Europe that we invested heavily in and then actually farmers invested in, this may be put in a, in a huge danger if we, uh, um, if we go the way how it's okay. being planned now. Sultan, the, the measure of gain for either side in this in the agricultural sector isn't huge. Can you foresee that TTIP at the end, if a deal has to be done, that agriculture is left out? No, no, no. I mean, even if you want it to, uh, we have very strict uh, international trade uh, rules. So I think there is an expression that uh, if uh, some parties engage in uh, trade negotiations, then uh, substantially all trade uh, needs to be covered. Uh, we can have some exceptions. And actually, uh, I was also happy to see that, uh, that there seemed to be an agreement that there is no threat that you know we will be flooded with uh, unsafe products. So there is no doubt about the safety of the, you know, the products on both sides. Here, really, the issue is you know this farm to fork uh, approach, how the way we produce uh, our, our food. And here, I, I can also can, can, can give you a kind of uh, reassurance, or maybe you know, a, a very important correction that. The Commission itself cannot, you know, just introduce rules to please uh, corporate uh, interest. Uh, the Commission 
can take initiatives but at the end of the day everything needs to be adopted by 28 member states and the European Parliament so let's assure that you know commission is not going to cook anything uh, dirty behind closed doors in secret uh, we can just make proposals and member states will adopt them Mark the the, the Americans from Europe, most people presume the Americans are always in favor of free trade. It's a part of the land of opportunity, but that's not the reality, is it? No, no it's not the reality. In the United States, there are some people reluctant to uh, sign a, an agreement. I don't speak about Donald Trump, but I hope that he will not be president of the United States. But a trade union, for example, because uh, some uh, social protection is higher, standards are higher in Europe than in the United States, and they are afraid of that. And uh, I think some farmers also, uh, but uh, in some sectors, the, uh, they are not all are uh, agree on the United States, and uh, it's too simple to say that. I think that uh, there are also uh, a debate in the United States uh, on the TTIP. Matt? Yeah, I think we need to recognize that people who are opposed to TTIP aren't necessarily opposed to free trade. I come from a country that is probably unique in Europe in that from the left to the right, everybody acknowledges the need and the importance of having free, tr free trade. Mm -hmm. People who have supported absolutely liberalized free trade agreements all their political lives are now saying this deal isn't about free trade. This, and that is why you're also seeing at the US level, people who have always supported free trade agreements are now saying this isn't working, this isn't the type of free trade because it's not fair trade, it's not actually um, citizen-based tr trade. Free trade traditionally has been about eliminating tariffs so that people could um, pass over and um, sell their goods to other countries. Increasingly this is about corporations being able, facilitating corporations to be able to become um, global entities and we've seen the outworking of that in terms of the tax um, payments that have been denied to several countries and the way in which they've been able to manipulate the um, global But if a consumer doesn't buy their products because they have an objection of the way it's produced, then how does the corporation gain? Well, the reality is that a lot of consumers will purchase what they, is most affordable to them and they will ask questions later and there is an obligation on the state to ensure that the product that is on the shelves is of, is of sound and safe quality. And increasingly there are um, a growing number of people who want to ensure that what they are buying is of that quality. The difficulty is that we will now have products or we could have potentially have products that are sitting side by side on a shelf in a supermarket. One is produced by a European farmer who because of all the quite rightly um, regulations and guidelines that we have put in place in relation to animal welfare, environmental practice, all the things I've mentioned before, will be, a, will be more expensive than that's what's beside it, produced by an Amer American corporate farm interest who have not been liable or responsible for the same level of regulations. And that fundamentally is the difficulty that European farmers need to be wise about because unfortunately there has been an effort by some governments and by some um, proponents of TTIP to pit farmer against farmer. So they've said, okay, beef might lose, but whatever beef will lose, dairy will win. Absolutely nonsense because this is part of a collective of deals, starting with CETA and TTIP, moving to Mercosur and most likely moving to okay. um, um, New Zealand and Australia. No farmer in Europe, considering the information that we already have, would support TTIP or CETA or any of these trade deals because this isn't about selling European produce. This is about actually changing the ownership of the products that we're buying in our, okay. um, in our supermarkets. We'll come to Pelbo in just a moment. You have some figures on the cost of production in America against Europe and, and the labour cost of that as well. And Magda, your organisation produced a report uh, recently as well ab about the impact of farmers. Tell us about the, the key narrative of that. Well, th yeah, that's a report that we produced because we found a vacuum actually on uh, the impacts on the agriculture and on farmers specifically. So we used ex uh, the data that was uh, done by the uh, that was used by the commission, or we found in other reports, and we kind of pulled it together. And the data is basically showing that there, there is not a rosy future for the farmers in Europe with uh, with the TTIP, and actually every uh, sector of farming sector is going to lose one way or another with the deal. Probably the only uh, gains will be in a very specific products that have been uh, traded and uh, that will be protected by the geographical indications which the Commission put forward as a, one of the uh, uh, trading uh, offensive trading um, areas. But this is 
this constitutes for the moment 6% of the agriculture production. It's not going to be okay. uh, anything that can save uh, small and medium-sized farmers and but the way how we okay. produce food. Let me just uh, come to Pablo. Pablo, what were the figures you, you were speaking about earlier and in terms of the, the difference between America and Europe? Uh, no. Can I ask something before? Sure. Uh, back, but I'm from the north of Spain and there are a lot of farmers, small farmers, not big companies. And the meat in the, n the north of Spain is quite good meat with mm. quality. And I talked uh, last week, I think, with a farmer from my region, and he, he said, "I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because of the free trade. I'm afraid because of the quality. So if I pr if I need to produce, if it co uh, it will cost me more to produce one kilo of my of my meat than the one that comes from the U.S. So." Uh, okay. Does uh, it mean that I have to change my way of producing? Let me ask Sultan about this first. Surely this is just consumer choice. You want to pay more for your meat, pay more for your meat. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we just discussed a couple of minutes ago that uh, that regulators can ensure that uh, meat on the market, on the shelf of the supermarkets, comply with the uh, safety rules. It's safe, sound, it's not going to harm your health. For the rest, as you said, you know, it's, it's somehow uh, consumer choice. Uh, it, but just coming back to the meat and you know, issues like animal welfare, which was, which was also mentioned, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, uh, issue, uh, the whole agriculture production. Uh, I believe us that you know, both the member states, uh, also the European Parliament experts, and also the negotiators know all the nitty gritties and they pay attention. So, for example, when it comes to animal welfare, this is one of the first negotiations when animal, animal welfare has been brought to the negotiation table. So we try to make progress and of course uh, the concessions that we might give on some import sensitive products, amongst them many meats, many beef, will also depend on what we can achieve on issues like animal welfare, but we can also uh, extend it to sustainability, uh, climate issues. So all these issues are on the table and okay. uh, I hope that a balanced package will come out. Mark. If we don't have a specific measure for agriculture and for production uh, which uh, are suffering now in Europe, it would be difficult. And uh, I, I can uh, say to Pablo, uh, for your farmers, your producers of meat, they have to fear more the agreement with Mercosur, Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay, because uh, in Argentina, Brazil and Uruguay, they produce meat as in Europe, in France, in Belgium, in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, high quality meat. United States, uh, they are more favorable for the meat for hamburger. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know the term in English, but... Uh, minced. Minced meat. Minced, okay. And, of course, uh, we have to fear that because, as I said, we, we don't have measure to, uh, to regulate the production and to ensure an income for farmers. Look, I, I understand the, the producer, but be careful to Mercosur-Europe agreement. But let me ask about the financing this. A lot of the negotiating chapter deals with financing in particular. It, it reads more like a financial package than a trade deal for a large part of it. Uh, do you think that in the end there is a way to compensate Europe's farmers or are we, we past that in terms of political discussion? I think that we have to change radically the, the, the cap, the, the, the policy of agriculture common Where policy. Where do you start? I hope that we don't, we don't have a health check of the cap. We need now to think a new cap for 30 years, no five years. Five years is politician time. Election 2014, 2019, 2024. Farmers, when a young farmer invests now in agriculture, he, he wants to have a vision for 30 years at least. And as a strategy, as a strategic policy, we have to, to do that. And for example, to examine the, the contracycling uh, subsidies and to help and to diminish the high volatility. Volatility is still existing on agriculture, but to limit the high volatility is very important. And I think we have to regulate to, to find other mechanism because we abandon the quota. Okay, I know quota is impossible to speak about that, unfortunately, but we have to, okay. to have other way for, to regulate the production. Magda, from your, your study, in terms of the financing, where do you see the, the weak spots? Where do you think their progress could be made? Well, I, I think in terms of uh, financing of the agriculture, the two systems are very different. And Mark was talking about volatility of prices and how the U.S. system supports then the farmers versus the EU system that is different. 
But going back to the to the uh, farmer who is producing beef in northern Spain, I think we really have to worry because in the moment when the market is flooded with cheaper product, with cheaper beef that comes from the U.S. that is produced in a big uh, uh, intensive farms. The, the, those who are producing more extensively, who are producing uh, with fat grazed uh, 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 cattle, they are going to lose because there will be less uh, people buying their product and by default they will be losing their, their uh, income. If they lose their income, they will ha have to also, probably some of them will decide to stop farming or to stop producing what they were producing. So we are actually entering a vicious circle that is not only because that we will have a, a, a meat uh, increase uh, here that that has uh, that is grown with the hormones etc but the increase in quantity will have okay. a big impact on uh, so we are talking not only about that the trade is increasing but uh, the trade diversion that will happen and how much it impacts european farmers i think it's really okay. something that haven't been looked at by the commission mccarthy is this putting European food security at risk? Yeah, um, in, a, in a nutshell, because you asked about the finances. The reality is that this is a false economy. The general, um, the, the general principle that we can take is that, by and large, people in Europe aren't going to be eating any more beef or, any, or drinking any more milk or eating any more agricultural product. And the same is true for the US. You're dealing with two very advanced societies. The only question is, who's going to be producing the food that they eat? And it's clear to me, having read every available document in relation to TTIP and agriculture, that this is, this is a drive towards removing the um, production of the food we eat away from the small network of European family farms that, w that is our, our common agriculture policy to date has been based on and moving it away from that to a more corporate intensification of food production. That's not good for farmers, obviously, but it's also not good for societies. It's not good for economies at a domestic level. It's good for one section of people, and that's the corporate interest. And that's why I believe that every farmer across Europe needs to be very concerned and vigilant in relation to this deal. So, Son, how do you answer that? Uh, my answer is very simple that you know, I'm a kind of born optimistic that I really believe, genuinely believe that uh, this sustainable, high quality European agri food sector and here agri food, I also mean that you know, agriculture who is providing the input for the agri food, for the food part, uh, has a bright future. I mean, demand for high quality stuff is increasing. Uh, thanks to the cap reforms, uh, the European agriculture also became more open to, uh, to react to these market needs. Now just look, look at the Asia, you know, uh, European pig meat is uh, outcompeting uh, Brazilian and, 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 and US uh, producers. We have a 60, I don't know how many percent uh, increase of our uh, agri-food export. Uh, and we shouldn't be worried about f you know, uh, certain producers being flooded with uh, cheap import because, uh, again, as I said, for import-sensitive products and some of the needs are amongst them, we're not going to have a total market opening. So that will be a quantitative limited uh, uh, market opening. Okay, Mark Tarbella, in terms of vol volatility, market volatility, Europe is calm at the moment. The Euro, we'll, we'll see what happens after the summer with Italy. But is there a sense that if we govern well, if we maintain our economic structure well, we can get an overall competitive advantage in the agricultural sector, or does it not matter? Uh, now, the high volatility, it means uh, for uh, some producers, and for example, for in the meat, uh, meat, uh, milk sector, it's a lower price. For more than one year, it's 25 uh, euro cent per liter at maximum. It's under the cost of production. It's, that is non-sustainable, and I, 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 we have to react about that. Uh, we, uh, I think that uh, it's um, unbelievable to maintain farmers without income for their job, for their work. They produce the basis of our food, and they are not respected as workers. It's one of the main issues that we have to resolve in the future for a sustainable agriculture. It means that they want to earn money for their jobs. And it's for that reason that uh, we have to change the cap because payment per hectare is a nonsense. In the future, we have to pay for job to maintain activity and, uh, and to have a stability of income for the farmers. Okay, we're going to come to a close in just a moment. I want to ask you just very briefly, one word answer if you want to. Matt Carthy, will TTIP uh, be agreed? I hope not, um, and I will do everything that I can to stop it. 
Zoltan will tee up your grades. Uh, if not, it would be a missed opportunity Mike for that. both sides. Honestly, at this point, I hope not, because we haven't seen that the Commission is really hearing what people are saying and what the, the concerns are. Mark Tarabell. No, it would be a missed opportunity for a multinational, but for citizens, I hope not, of course. As for the Pablo, TTIP will be agreed? I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, I hope yes, but with a lot of change. Okay, let me, uh, before we just thank our, our panel today, let's summarize what we discussed today. TTIP is in the middle game. It's, it may fail at the, the last hurdles, but uh, the secrecy, the transparency, there's, there's been a difficult path uh, that's brought us to this point. A lot of uh, political capital has been spent just uh, getting a framework agreed without getting to the details. There's a, a pragmatism uh, emerging. Perhaps in the end, agriculture uh, will have to face uh, more compromises as it's uh, dealt with at the end, and there's more flexibility to be had there. But TTIP has produced a fear factor. Uh, but uh, the Irish sector has shown that the bilateral agreements are possible and that a positive attitude to free trade agreements is possible. So this isn't uh, an all or nothing scenario. The non-tariff barriers uh, have been uh, the, the cornerstone of the, of the criticism. Uh, consumer protection being at the core uh, of everything that's been discussed, getting from negotiating table to the kitchen table. Globalization and the, the, the profits uh, shifting to uh, cor large corporations have tainted the process as well. But the Commission remains optimistic that a, a deal can be done, uh, and yet we're left with criticisms that the end product uh, is the real concern, not uh, uh, not uh, what, what we're doing from the, the farm to, to the fork. The food chain uh, is not just the only concern, but the food security of Europe as well. And the view from the USA is not as rosy as many Europeans presume it to be. Should we look to uh, Mercosur uh, to advance our uh, agricultural side uh, rather than the United States? And will uh, volatility of production uh, and pricing uh, reduce small farmers uh, to uh, despair and cause them to leave the, the land altogether. Let me thank our, our uh, panelists, Mark Tarabella, Matt Carthy, Zoltan Samogi, Magda Soskiewicz, and uh, Pablo Baldomir. Thank you all for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you.